Okay, so um, we now know how to um, get the server running and import data. Then the next part is, is of course, using that data. And to use the data, you first have to get at it. Um, so I'll be going over um, that now first. Um, most of this I'll be using uh, the, the air quality service for. I'll post a link in chat so everybody can follow along again and try out himself. But in on the website under uh, on the website under data nests, there are also the other sources that also have really interesting things in them. So the data model, well, I think now pretty much covered that. Um, so I'll skip that for now. Basic request we've also seen. Um, so the, the index page, just the, the, the version number, then the type or the collection to get all of the type and with the ID to get one of the type. Um, that we also covered quite well. Um, we didn't really cover the links yet. Um, so they all, they all follow the same pattern. Um, at IoT ID is generally, an, uh, everything with an at in it is, is generally um, the, the, the server generated uh, bits. So at IoT.ID is the, the, the ID of the entity. And, and at IoT.self link is the, the URL that this entity can be found at. Um, let's actually uh, go to our um, air quality service to actually, oh great, oh that's strong, wrong, wrong, wrong URL. I'm scared a bit there a second. Um, at IoT self link contains the link that, that this entity exists at. And so that is basically the same with the ID in it. Then there's the things called at IoT navigation link. That's the links to other entities. Um, and they can be either linking to an instant, a specific entity or to a collection. So if I have a thing, then data streams is also, that's why it's data streams that's because and the thing has multiple data streams or can have multiple data streams. But the link back is to thing, which is singular because a data stream can only have one thing. So from these, these properties, you can also already see whether you'll, if you follow the link, whether you'll be getting one or one single entity or an, a list of entities. So that's for the related objects. <coughs> Then tailoring responses, that's where things get really interest, interesting. So if I go to uh, this service and ask for, give me all things, I get a um, 100 things, but I can guarantee you there are more things in this service than 100. So first of things, first of all, we can get the count by saying dollar count is true. Technically, a server can already always automatically return the count, but if you uh, specifically say it in the URL count is true, then the server must return the count. You have to be a bit careful. If you ask observations with count is true on this server, you will not be getting a response because counting, this server has more than 300 million observations and counting those takes too long. That's uh, actually a known problem with relational databases that counting items, items, especially when there are a lot of them, is, can be very slow. But counting things is usually not a problem. And um, this service has uh, 4.3 thousand things. Of course, by default, it doesn't return me 4.3 thousand things because that would be a huge document. And that would be a, a huge document. And um, that's not very useful. Just a second. Ah, that was my son that also wanted to play along. <laughs> That's the disadvantage of homework working at home. All right, I was saying, um, returning all those entities would be too big of a document and that would not be useful. So the server by default usually limits the number of items you get back. Um, but you can also say yourself how many items you want with the, um, with the top parameter. So if I say top is 10, I only get 10 items. So if, if I'm, I'm not certain how big the items are or how many there are, it's, it's usually a good idea to, to do a first request, especially when you're using your browser to discover a server. 
to do a first request with a, a rather low top, so you're not uh, directly downloading megabytes of data. Of course, um, I just asked for 10, but there are more, and that's why the server generates me a next link at IoT next link. This next link will go to the next 10 or the next, yeah, the next 10 in this case, because I have a top of 10, the next 10 items in the list. So there's a top of 10 and a skip of 10. And then I follow the link and I get the next, and get item 10 to 20 or 11 to 20. And then it generates a new next link. As you see, the, the, the next link also contains all the parameters I've been using. So if I say top is 11, skip is 10, it will actually say, okay, the top is 11 will be coming back here. And if I add again um, the count, it will also say, well, okay, you wanted the count for the previous one, so the next link will also have a count. I can explicitly say count is false, and then it does not add the count, and the next link will also have that. So that's important because there are more and uh, items for instance sorting order by let's go back to the first things um, by default there is no sorting order so you might be getting your things in any order they the database might like to return them which is actually order that can change when you edit your entities if you change an entity the it might end up at the end of the of your list or somewhere in the middle. Um, databases uh, can do weird stuff when uh, when editing, and so the, the the order by default is not specified. So order by um, if I want to order by ID, then I get I'm actually from one to three. Of course, the default is ascending. I can also say no, I want them descending, and then it goes from the highest ID to the lowest. Um, I can also I can order by any property, so I can also order by name, and then I get uh, the station that starts happens to be named air quality station first. Um, there are quite a lot of air quality stations. Let's go descending and start with the Z. Mm. Oh, they're all air quality stations. Oh, no, so oh, I, mean, I was name. looking at the description it, of the name. Exactly. Sorry? You're, you're sorting by name, so the, the description is still always the air quality station. Yeah, uh, I was, I was oh, looking, looking at the wrong um, one. There is actually a, 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 a Zeebelboden in, uh, in Austria. I can also uh, sort for instance, you can sort by any property, and whether all implementations support that is, of course, not, not, not guaranteed. But um, in, in Frost, you can also sort by your properties. So you can also sort by uh, by the begin time, which might be useful if you want to know which is the station that the oldest station that I have. Um, so you can sort by uh, properties slash begin time, and then I've we've got a station that started in uh, 1886. Is that correct, Kathy? <laughs> Yep, that's Sonbrick. That's one of our oldest stations out in the Alps, and I think it was started by some monks. Wow. So we, we've got some decent time series lying around. Indeed. And uh, the youngest station is an, uh, in Czechoslovakia, I think, from 2000. Slovakia. Slovakia. And the Belgians also have a pretty new, pretty recent station. So that's uh, order by. Um, then the really interesting one is, uh, well, is, is select, because you can see this is quite a big page. Um, and especially when you, you do things like ordering by name, then maybe you don't want to see everything, um, all the other properties. So you can do um, select this ID from a name, and that reduces the size a bit. And you can quickly get an overview of which, which, which entities exist there. Um, you can add the description. No, there. No, don't start a new browser. Close. Then we go filter. Filtering is cool. 
because of course um, you don't always want to see everything. Um, let's add instead of description properties because usually I end up filtering on properties. For instance, we have a country code in here. So I might be interested in, okay, give me all the stations that are from Denmark. Well, I can filter is properties, uh, country code equals Denmark. And look, I only get the stations from Denmark. And then now what? tell me how many there are. There are 14 stations in Denmark. And here it is important that the, the thing I mentioned about next link that they contain all the parameters. Well, because if I um, for now just say okay and give me the, give me the first five, you can see that the next link contains uh, my top, my skip, my select. So the select is also kept and the filter. So you actually the next link is really the next set of the items that I have in my current current selection and account. Well, a, a short comment to the participant. If somebody can think of a query they would be interested in, type it in the chat and challenge Hilke to it. I've yet to find something he cannot manage to formulate. Yeah. I mean, what we can't do here, one, one of my favorite tricks he had was putting a threshold for a measurement value into the thing. So you could have in your monitoring facility a threshold for that station and then do a query across the entire data model to please provide me all observations which go over the threshold which has been stored within the, the monitoring station. Yeah. Um, and while Kathy was saying that, I was looking up um, the observed property NO2, which is IoT ID, which has name NO2. That's good. Because you can, you can of course, now I've been, been showing how to filter um, based on entities uh, of, of properties of the entities themselves, cells, but you can also filter on things that are further away. So here we've got um, 14 Danish stations. Let's see how many of those stations measure NO2. So, and, well, that means if the station measure NO2, it has to has data, have a data stream with an observed property that measures NO2. So data streams slash observed property. And uh, in this case, it's the name equals NO2. And there are 13 stations, 13 of those 14 stations in Denmark measure NO2. So to go uh, quickly back to the data model. So what I did, <coughs> I was requesting things and I was filtering based on the data streams of the thing and then the observed property of that da those data streams and they're the name. So only things that have a data stream that have an observed property that have the name NO2 were returned. So you can really filter across the entire data model. You could also, um, for instance, um, request all the observed properties that are being measured at a certain thing. Then you do the same thing, the same sort of the same query, but the other way around. Um, I've shown uh, the equal, but uh, you can also say not equal. So you can uh, get everything that have all the observed properties that are all the stations that uh, measure anything that is not NO2. And greater than, greater equal, less than, less equal. That's usually for numeric ones, but it would also also works for dates in the in the phenomenon time, for instance, of your observation. I showed that you can uh, combine filters with and or 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 not, and you can make complex things with uh, with, with uh, parentheses. You can group things. Um, you can uh, use mathematics. That's also always an interesting one. For instance, the, this, the length of a string. Um, let's go back to our things. And do just funny, funny, funny results. Um, and um, first of all, um, most of those functions also work for order by. So let's order by the length of the name. 
takes a bit longer because uh, it uh, has to calculate the length, but the, the, the shortest names is actually a station named AKH in Austria. General Hospital in Vienna, Allgemeines Krankenhaus. And uh, not so that's a uh, descending. The longest name is uh, that one. Austria has, has interesting properties. They have short names, long names. But you can also say, well, okay, only give me, uh, let, 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 only filter um, stations that have a, linked, a, li a length of an, the, the name that is less than, uh, less than five. That's only one, okay. Lesser or equal than five. It's a little bit long. And uh, I want to know how many there are. Oh, it's like, it's not a very few. Six, is that still not a lot? Seven? Okay. Um, there are eight stations with a name less than seven characters. Or less than seven or less, fewer characters. Eight, and a bit more. Six plus ten, that should, uh, yeah, 25. Now most stations have an, have an actual sensible name. Um, you can also do, do, do matching of substrings and, uh, or uh, yes, indeed search for a specific string in, in, your, in your names. You can do also a bit of, of mathematics with uh, rounding or ceiling or floor. Um, and then of course it's an OGC standard. So there are lots of geospatial filters. Um, <clears throat> find me all the stations in a certain region or um, all the stations within a certain distance of a given point. Things like that are also possible. And then there was of course functions for time. Um, Interesting one is now, but um, I'll not go into, I'll, I'll get to the cool queries a bit later. Because there is also expanding. Um, that's another, the, the second really cool feature. Because of course, getting things is one thing, but if I want to put my things on a map, I also will need the locations of those things. So first, let's uh, reduce the size of my, uh, my returned thing, uh, or return data, ID comma name. So these are uh, the names of all my things. And now I want also the location. So I say expand is locations. And that directly gives me the, all the locations for each thing. So this I could directly plot on the map. Of course, it's uh, a bit big. So um, I want to have some parameters. Those locations should also be have a select in it. ID comma um, location comma encoding encoding time there which a bit bit reduced there I have my uh, my things with the name and uh, the location with just a uh, encoding type the ID and the geometry in the location and then I also want the data streams for that. And for the data streams, I want uh, just the name. And then I get the date names of the data streams with that. Most of these are only affairs, and this one has lots of data streams. And then for those data streams, I also want, uh, again, expand um, with uh, observations. And for those observations, I want to uh, only one. And I want them. Expand and it'll work better. Let's say what? Add an X to your expand and it'll work better. Ah, yes. Typo. Thank you. And I want the order by uh, is phenomenon time descending. Ah, of course. If you type in too long, you will get typing errors. So order by that means I missed a dollar sign. And there's another typo somewhere or order by, I need order by. Being dyslexic, it doesn't help a lot. 
And there we go. I've got all my things with their location and the data streams and the last observation. And this you could directly put on a map and color all your things according to the results of your observations. And of course, in this case, I've requested all the data streams, but I could, for instance, also add a filter. I'm not going to do that because that will guarantee me making typos. I could say only give me the data streams for a certain observed property because you can add all those query parameters. Uh, Taylor and responses. All these query parameters are also valid inside expands. So inside an expand, you can also use top, skip, count, order by, select, filter, and expand itself. And that's that's uh, once you get used to this, that's really powerful for your for your use cases because you can actually make a request that gives you all the data you need for your use case in one request, regardless almost regardless of, of whatever your use case is. I mean, it's, it's one request, but it's also nested within one object. I like the way it merges in other pieces. So you still you're starting at your thing object and you've now packed the data streams and the observations into the thing. So if you're now using a, a simple display tool, you have one thing object with the value attached. Yes. Of course, that uh, then uh, that makes it a bit tricky. How do I design my query? Um, because if I'm interested in observations, I could um, just query directly slash observations. Um, doing that on this air quality service with 300 million observations uh, is probably not the most useful thing, but it might be for a certain use case usable. You can start from your data streams and then expand your observations, or you've got start from the features of interest and expand observations, or you could start from a thing and then expand the data streams and then expand the observations, or maybe you're interested in a certain observed property and from there go to the data streams and do the observations. That's all possible. And um, what you get back depends on where you start. So if I st indeed start at observations and then say, okay, I want observations and I want the data stream with that observation and the observed property, then I would get a flat result because I'm getting back a list of observations. And then for each observation, I would get a data stream. But if I have a thousand observations of the same data stream, I would also get the data for that data stream a thousand times because for each observation, it will be expanded again. Well, if I go the other way around and ask a data stream with a thousand observations, I only get the data stream once and then in that data stream, all its observations. Um, if I uh, also, if, if I, start with observations, I can no longer say, give me the latest observation for each data stream, because there is only one list I'm requesting on observations. And that means there is only one latest observation in this list. But if I start at the data stream and then expand observations, I can say, okay, give me all data streams. And for each data stream, expand the observations. And for this, give me the latest one because each data stream has a latest observation. So this is uh, th th this required to get really get the hang of it. You need to practice a bit um, uh, and, and get the hang of the data model um, and play around a bit with your data. So I've got two examples here. Starting from the observation, you would basically get a flat list that looks a bit like CSV. And indeed, in Frost, you can actually say, okay, and give me it now as a comma separated file. That works. Um, but if you start from the things, you actually get a tree and a nice nested structure. So thing one, and then the data stream, and maybe the observed property, and then the observations of this data stream. And then the second data stream is nested in also in the thing. So there you get a, a nested structure, which is usually a bit easier to handle. But there are also use cases where you do indeed just want all the observations and uh, want to process it as such. Okay, looking at the time, I have to go a bit faster. <coughs> um, 
Then there is uh, something called a result format parameter that I have not mentioned before. Um, this parameter can be used to um, request that the server returns your data in a different result format. There's only one standardized result format in the standard so far, which is data array, which can be used on uh, observations only. Um, so if I quickly go to a, um, to a thing, um, to a, uh, let's go to a data stream. I don't know what this is, doesn't matter with observations. So this is the normal way observations are returned. So each for each observation, all the entities are fully spelled out. If I add um, the result format, data array, then instead of saying the full name of each entity, each property, it just lists, lists the properties once, and then it just lists a nested array of all the properties. And of course, in this case, there are lots of nulls, but if I uh, combine that um, with the select is um, phenomenon time comma result, then it's a, it's a lot efficient, more efficient, um, a, a lot more efficient uh, way to get your observations, with smaller data size. Frost also has some extra extensions. You can get um, get directly GeoJSON, which is uh, useful if you have other GIS programs that you want to uh, use your data in. Um, I can give a quick example for, uh, for instance, uh, things. Uh, of course, thing itself doesn't have an, uh, have um, a geometry, so I do have to expand locations for it to be useful. Uh, locations. So this is the standard result format, and then I can say uh, and string result format is geometry. And now I get a uh, flattened GeoJSON. So GeoJSON has, uh, has a feature collection and each feature collection has a bunch of features and each feature is of type feature and has a geometry, which is a, has a type. Sensor things doesn't only do points, also does other things. You can also have polygons or lines. And then it adds all the properties that of, of my entities and my queries in the, in the properties of the GeoJSON. So this is something you could feed into, for instance, Qubis. And then lastly, you can also uh, get your data as uh, comma separated values, which is can be very useful if you want to uh, export your observations somewhere else. So if you're using this query, all the observations for a given data stream and um, the data stream ID and name, and then you get a CSV with the data you requested. And then I have a bunch of example queries um, that you can look over. Um, including the give me everything one that just expands almost everything and you get a big document But I'll uh, leave that as an exercise, given the time for the, I'll leave that as an exercise for the later readers. So then we are on for the last bit. Um, do we have a, a Mentimeter part in between, Kathy? Um, we probably should. Wait, wait, wait. Let me quickly set that up again. Then I should stop sharing. Let's see the chat. Okay, that was Kathy's question. Okay, you should now be seeing my screen again. And next question to all. So I think I have all gotten a, a far better overview of what the sensor things thingy can really do. Do you still think it, it supports what you need? 
how did we have five people, six people answered, not yes or no? Did I, did I provi provide a maybe there? No, it's only yes and no. Maybe your, uh, maybe the, the, the painting is broken. Yeah, there it goes. Much better. Okay, okay. So, so, so people are still, wait, no, nobody's saying no anymore. So every, everybody who was terrified left the webinar and the people who are left are happy with it. Let me counter check our audience size if I can. 28. So some people are still being a bit quiet on this. Okay, but it seems like the people willing to respond are also willing to play with this technology or at least think it would help them. Next question. I mean, the, the underlying question is who managed to follow all of the tricky bits which Hilke was presenting to us. Um, of course, I do have to say here that um, this was a, a quick introduction and um, there's a lot possible and it's pre pretty hard to, to take that all in and, and quickly see, well, does that support all my use, all the questions in my use case? So, um, I wouldn't be surprised if someone doesn't really know it yet. <laughs> I mean, to, to date, I ha have I managed to find a figure out a query you couldn't formulate. Yes, there are a few that 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 are um, not possible, but that's the the, the more exotic ones, um, where it's partly also if you could put the data differently in the server, it might be possible to do it. Um, well, I mean, it's and, e and even there. I mean, one then needs multiple requests. Yeah. It might need 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 multiple requests. That's a, usually that that happens when you have um, have fancy things with your feature of interest. Um, if you're if you have a feature of interest um, with with um, combined with moving things, and you want to get the latest observation from multiple data streams for one feature of interest, because that's that's not possible because there is no link between the feature of interest and the data stream. But those are really um, edge cases um, where you will have to, where you can get the data, you have to do one on one request. Okay, but it, it, it seems that this message has gotten through that just about everything you need, one can really query directly here. Next question, error handling. No, we have not even mentioned that yet. Well, you, well, you did show some errors. Which There's a, yeah. Going. I think for some reason my computer is getting lonely. Okay, one one person caught how you handled the errors, and the others are as confused as I tend to be of saying, "Oh my God, what did I do wrong?" And then I realize I wrote extent without a T. Yeah. So I forgot yet another ampersand. I mean this. This is one bit to everybody. It does take a while to get your brain around these formulations. One of our next steps, if we can find the project for it, would actually be to create a query generator. Again, it won't cover the tricky edge cases, but at least for simple bits, we'd like to foresee something which will support you in building these queries. The cool bit, which we'll be presenting in a moment, but when we're past this, is we have gotten a cool, simple way to map this stuff. And there you don't even have to deal with most of the errors because that's covered in the code. Okay, so error handling is something which we really need to do some more homework on. Well, um, we didn't explain it, so people are very honest. It's not clear how to do it because we didn't cover it in the tutorials. <laughs> okay, and... Let, let me go through this bit now also, because okay. then we're done with our questionnaires. Okay, first one managed to access it. Several people have managed because we have been getting data in our playground. Yeah. 
Okay, so there we seem to be very positive and are performing to what people would want. That, that's one bit which is actually missing in the API specification. We would need real, yes. are, are there backlinks there to the standard or probably more ideal would be also a backlink to a tutorial since as yeah. we said earlier, reading the standard is interesting, but if you really want to use it, it's not the best place to start. And this is also thing that something that is improved from version 1.0 1, 1. 0 to 1.1. 1. 1. Since in version 1.1, 1. 1, the index page actually has the list of, um, of conformance classes that the server implements. And those should in, at some point link. And when 1.1 1. 1 is finished, should link into the documentation or the standard itself. Okay, so here we've got, I mean, a lot of people did find the documentation regardless. A bit more homework here would be welcome, but that's in the pipeline anyway. And I would say that's it. Thank you very much for the survey participation. And now as a final part, Hilke will show you how to take all of this cool data and easily pop it onto a map. Yes. Um, uh, so mapping, we all love maps. That's why we are doing stuff with geospatial data. So um, I don't, I, given the time, I don't think we will get completely through this tutorial, but uh, if you do it uh, at your leisure um, later, this is actually the map you will be creating. And this is uh, the, 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 from our demography endpoint. Um, all the countries, um, the color is the, the population density. So um, we can see that uh, the Netherlands is quite densely populated. Um, let's make it a bit bigger. The Netherlands is quite densely populated with uh, 504 people per square meter kilometer. And, um, and Norway uh, is pretty empty with 17 people per square kilometer. More, more cool things is if you zoom in on this map, it'll um, subdivide by nut region, by smaller nut regions. And um, here you see things like, this is Berlin. Berlin is very densely populated. <laughs> this is uh, not densely populated. <laughs> And if you zoom in, you can you can very nicely see all the all the, the the areas around Berlin. There's basically nothing. And um, this is the the Ruhrgebiet, lots of uh, cities and big industry there. Paris is also a thing. I was a bit surprised at how uh, low low populated the rest of uh, France is. And also in Spain, you clearly see. Uh, the big cities and uh, here also around the coast, lots of cities. So that'll be the, the end point of the tutorial. <clears throat> and you can actually do all this with just a browser and a text editor. You don't even need a web server for this. So basic mapping, we need an HTML, start with an HTML page. So here I've got a, a bit of HTML. And I'm going to copy that. And then I'm going to um, uh, my, my, my um, file browser. So in this would be uh, Windows Explorer on Windows. I'm on Linux, a bit different. And I say, um, create me a new empty document. Um, Tutorialmap.html. So, and then I open that in a text editor. So Notepad++ would be uh, my suggestion for Windows users, but the normal Notepad nowadays is also quite doable. And there, and I paste my HTML and I save. And then I go back to here to my file browser and I open that uh, in uh, my web browser. And there we've got our base page. There is no map yet because we've not configured the map to be there. Um, let me open this, pull this in my other tabs so I don't uh, get too many tabs open. 
There's nothing to see there yet because we have not added that yet. It's an, uh, basically a placeholder. It has a div, uh, an item where the map has to go and there's an item where the JavaScript will have to go, but it's not filled in yet. If you don't want to copy it, there's also a download here. You can open that and you'll see the page as well. So to activate a map, we have to add a little bit of JavaScript to the, to the, the base script tag. Oh, I did add all the, 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 the necessary plugins for um, Leaflet. So the basics are there for the map. Now I need to uh, actually make a map. So I go back to my text editor and inside the JavaScript bit, I paste this, I save, go back to my web browser and I reload. And voila, we've got a map. This is just uh, OpenStreetMaps background. But no data yet. So let's uh, first add, uh, add some. STEM is our uh, Sensor Things API mapper, which is a leaflet or an open layers plugin that can uh, do sensor things. So now we add a layer to our map with the air quality data. Um, so I add, uh, I make a call to STEM. I say the base URL of the data is the air quality server. Should, should we quickly introduce STEM? That you've just taken out of nowhere. Um, I, 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 later. Okay. Um, I want uh, the, the things to uh, clusters because there are quite a lot of uh, stations, 4,000. I don't want to dial and download all of them. I only want to see the cluster, the stations, if there are less than 10 grouped in, a, in an area. And I want my queries to start at things. So I add that to my JavaScript. Save. And I uh, reload my map. And now we've got numbers on the on the map. This uh, there's quite a lot of air quality stations, except on this island. There's only one station there, so it's directly shown. And uh, in the north of Norway, there are also not not that many. If I then zoom in, the numbers get smaller until they're below ten, and then the station starts showing up. Since I'm in Karlsruhe, I'll uh, click on a station, and then I can say. And this is the data streams that exist for this uh, this thing, this station, and then I can click on NO2. And now it downloads all the observations for NO2, which is three years. This takes a while, but here are all the NO2 stations or the NO2 measurements since the January of 2018. Now, I'm downloading all the the the, the all the observations each time I click on it is not that useful. So I only want the observations for the last month. So I add a little option to stem. When I plot it, I want the start date to be now minus, this is uh, uh, one month in milliseconds and the end date is now. So I add that bit to my stem configuration. That goes here. I do have to add a comma. And then I reload my map. Now my uh, OpenStreetMap, ah, there it is. I zoom a bit in uh, on that same area, more or less there. It was Kalzoa, NO2. And now it only shows one month, which is uh, a bit more useful for uh, hourly air quality measurements. So that's how easy it is to get your first data from a sensor things API service on a on a map. So what is STEM? Um, STEM is the, the sensor things API mapper. It has a GitHub page. It's uh, created by uh, a student of uh, Kathy, an intern, in what was it, six weeks? 
he managed to, to slap that together over the summer. Exactly. I think it was uh, six weeks or so he, he, had, he had the time. And he, he's not even a student yet. This kid is 17. <laughs> yeah. And um, we created this one because there are plenty of ways to do maps. <clears throat> but one of the things was that what you really need, if you have many data, lots of data, is this, 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 this loading depending on how many things you have in your area. Because you can imagine, um, well, this is still, this is only, uh, this server only has uh, 4,000 uh, stations. It's not too bad. But if I go to another example, um, in, um, in my um, data nest, Franco Germanic flow, there we've got um, the, the surface water quality stations in France. And um, France has a lot of surface water quality stations. And here, this, this, map is, this, is, this map is not yet using STEM. And here it is loading 19,000 stations. And um, eventually it'll get there and then it works fine. But until it's there, you're waiting. And that's why one of the things in STEM, what that STEM can do is instead of just directly downloading all the things, it takes the, the OpenStreetMap tiles and um, it first asks how many stations exist in this tile and if by doing a count query. And only if there are fewer than 10 or a configurable amount, it will actually request the stations. So now it's finally done. And um, yeah, here you see indeed France has um, almost 19,000 things in that area. So that's why, uh, why STEM now exists, because it can do um, the loading based on the number of things in an area. Uh, short, short input, there's a question in the chat asking if you've tried using WebGL. Um, I am not familiar with WebGL, but this in, the, in this case, for this loading, it's really the loading of the data that's the problem, so not the display. Um, if you have a lot of things, and um, especially when you have not point things, but uh, polygon things, you get a large data size and you have to download that to your browser before you can display it. So um, yeah, it, it's, uh, it's the initial loading that, that, that that's the problem in, the, in many cases. I mean, the, especially the power of the STEM application is that it also, it, it really, it, it has integrated the sensor things logic. So it takes a lot of the query formulation away from you. Yeah. So it's, it's, uh, I mean, uh, um, Leaflet can also lo does show lots of points. That's not a problem. It's, uh, it's the loading of the points that, that's, that's the slow part. You don't want to, on one hand, you don't want to overload your server, especially if you also uh, do things, things like ex directly expanding all your data streams and asking for the last observation. If you're doing that for in, in the in the ground in the surface water case with 19,000 stations, and then each station has up there, in that case, up to 1,500 data streams. Um, the amount of data that you have to transfer before you can even start displaying it is is the problem. So it's, it's nicely taking the logic away. It's first counting how many objects will there be there, and only if it's a displayable amount of objects, it'll even really get the individuals, or it'll just give you the count. It it also does the tiling nicer. That I mean. Leaflet open layers can do tiling, but they don't do it based on standard units. And the grouping keeps shifting around, and that we've adjusted that we're we're focusing on the, the open layers tiles. And we always first query the amount of stations within a tile, then decide to display depending on how you've configured the application. Yeah. So the next uh, bit, um, <coughs> looking at the time, I uh, can't actually go too far in it, but I do want to show a bit about the, the data model here. It's exactly this case of polygon things. Um, in our demography use case, um, 
we have uh, demography um, data. So that was our, um, our map um, that was in the, uh, this map, exactly. So if I click on a country, I get all the demography, um, age, gender, cut downs, uh, population density, things like that, with um, shapes. And those are all in, in the sensor things API. So if I um, look at this server and ask, um, okay, give me um, for the country code Germany, um, give me the location um, and uh, nuts level zero, which is top level of zero, I get uh, Germany. Um, oh. I can then go um, to nuts level one which is um, the Bundesländer in the case of Germany, the states in Germany. There are 16 of those. And then I can go to NUT level two. There's 38 of those. And then I can get to NUT, NUT level three. And there are 401 of those. Um, and those are, of course, all for the same for Germany. So um, if I were to load that in a standard naive map, you would get overlapping things. And um, you would actually have four layers deep of overlapping things. Um, that's not very useful. So um, one of the other things that STEM can do is you can set for a zoom level, which query should be used to load things. So that's why it is possible um, in, uh, in this map that if you zoom in, you start out at NUTS level zero. And if you zoom in, it'll go to NUTS level one all the way until I zoom in a lot, you get the smallest nuts level, um, which is, I think, three, which is the, 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 the smallest uh, Gemeinde, I think. So we, we, can, we can have a query that loads those nuts levels. But then let's have a look at the locations, because that's also special in the service. If I look, if I load the locations for Germany, I see it takes a while, and then I get a very big document. So let me close the chat. A very big document that actually has it's it's one entity, as you see, on one thing because Germany there's only one Germany, fortunately, but there are multiple locations in this in the service. So Germany has five locations. And the difference here is um, the scale. Um, the Eurostat supplies this data in um, the, these nut regions in, in five different scales from one to one million to one to 60 million. And of course, um, looking at the one to 60 million um, and uh, looking there at the location, we get uh, three decimal points for our uh, geometries. And uh, you can see it a bit at the size of my, of my scroll bar. It's not so long. And if I look at the one to one million, and there look at the details, I get more decimal points. And it's a lot more points. So when I am in a very zoomed out state, I probably don't want to download the highest highest level because, and on the other hand, if I'm in a zoomed in state, I don't want a lower resolution scale. So the other thing that this map does, um, and you can see that in these islands, if I, if I zoom out, you'll see them um, vanish because the, at, at low zoom level, they don't bother adding the islands. And if I zoom in, you get more detail until you get a, a nice, nice polygons for each island. So that's the, the other thing that this tutorial then goes over is um, how can you configure STEM to change the zoom level or change the, the, the location that is loaded based on the zoom level and, um, and change the nuts region based, based on the zoom level. So that when you're zoomed in, you get uh, the smallest nuts region in the highest resolution. 
and then you're zoomed out, you get the, the very uh, coarse nuts, uh, or the, the, the highest tier nuts level in a very low resolution. But unfortunately, we do not have time to actually make all that. But if you go to the tutorial, to the tutorial you will end up with this map. Colored based on the, on the um, population density and loading nuts levels based on zoom level and resolution based on zoom level. So that concludes our um, mapping tutorial as well. I would say we, we have shown what we have to show and would now open the floor to any and all questions. Hoping that we haven't confused everybody to the point of silence. Is anybody still left? Yeah, still 27, good. Yes, I think uh, also a very important uh, aspect of sensor things that many people um, overlook is that you do not have to have point things. You can have mm, polygon things and, and line things. And uh, geospatial uh, querying can also deal with that. So if you have polygon things, you can actually say, um, give me all the polygons that overlap this point. Of, or um, give me, um, give me the, 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 in the case of rivers, give me all the rivers that, that uh, cross through this region. Those are all possible. I mean, the, the other advantage of this little STEM library we built, I mean, it, it covers basic use cases. We're fairly sure if you then are setting up your site, you will need more. But it's a beautiful starting point which foresees all of the tricky bits. So I think if you start with that as a software, you may end up re-implementing it all. But you've got clear code examples which show you where are you likely to run into problems and what one can do about it. Yeah, and at the API for Inspire site, there are also uh, all the other, other use cases and most of them also have, um, have examples uh, that uh, either in, in STEM or in other content management systems that uh, visualize the data. I mean, a, a further point where I'd like feedback now based on the, the adoption of Sensor Things API and Inspire, does anybody see issues why this would cause a problem? And um, I think we can turn on microphones for this, I mean. Yeah. Um, who, who, who can let people speak? Or can people just unmute themselves? We can unmute ourselves, I think. Yep. Very good, please, please speak. <laughs> Everybody is uh, too impressed to speak. They're just tired. <laughs> I think would need to to think about that. Nothing I could come up with right now, but I guess we would first need to investigate that before we could really answer. Well, I mean, further feedback to everybody that the API for Inspire project is running until next February. And part of our job is supporting the wider community with the uptake of these technologies. So. If you have issues, get in touch with us, check through what all we've been providing on the website. Also provide us feedback if our tutorials are confusing. I mean, we've done our best to make them understandable, but it's, it's up to you if you can understand it. If you can't understand it, it's probably our fault, not your fault. Yes, and uh, that's also the reason why I made them all as, uh, on the website, so you can uh... You can follow them at home at your leisure. Um, but feedback is very much welcome. Kathy, Ilke, if I can just say a couple of uh, closing words. Uh, 
Um, I'm Marco Minghini. I'm supervising the um, API for Inspire project uh, um, on behalf of the, the ELISE and also the GRC Inspire team, together with uh, my colleague Alexander Kotsev, who I think I had to leave uh, some minutes ago. Um, I would... Uh, uh, I just would like to thank Katia uh, uh, and Ilke for this great workshop. Um, I, I believe it has been really great. Uh, they managed to teach us Sensor Things API in, in one single afternoon, or at least uh, uh, they managed to give us a very clear idea of the potential of this technology. I think we are now all um, looking forward to the MIG meeting next week, where hopefully um, OGC Sensor Things API as an inspired download service will gain the status of an endorsed uh, inspired good practice. Um, as Cathy said, uh, if you want just to stay uh, updated with the results and the news on, on the project, uh, contact us or contact them, provide feedback, if any, um, on the workshop, of course, check the website that uh, we have been uh, using today, but also follow the uh, ELISE communication channels where we will also disseminate the results of the project and in particular the uh, final technical report uh, in uh, early uh, 2021. And uh, finally, thanks also for all the people who managed to uh, attend the workshop and uh, to stay until the very end. Um, this is really appreciated. So thanks again.